So I wanted to talk about scientific papers and one scientific paper I have read that I think is interesting in psychology of course is this one, Nature of Emotions. Human emotions have deep evolutionary roots, a fact that may explain their complexity and provide tools for clinical practice by Robert Plichnik in 2001. I just wanted to talk about this paper because it has a lot of concepts that are that I think are presented very well in, and they are also very cleanly explained, easy to understand for everyone. It's a great paper and it has a lot of concepts and models that, are, that you probably can recognize from, um, from other areas of your life. Plushik himself is one of the main researchers in the past, of course, in emotions and psychology so he really developed some theories and emotions that are groundbreaking and really illustrated a lot of key concepts very well and he was on the forefront of studying emotions and how humans feel and how these feelings interact with each other very interesting researcher and very very high up in the researcher hierarchy overall because he he thought so many thoughts that other people just could not develop in themselves and could not uh, they could not think that as clearly as him this is the paper so his uh, theory explains how our emotions human being emotions are um, developed in evolutionary natural selection so they're not just cultural concepts they're not just environmental or anything like that they have developed an evolution and here i mark this with uh, with blue where you really can see what he's talking about because up to the 50s we kind of studied animals a lot actually and we did study animals and apply some of these research factors and ideas to human beings so we studied doves, we studied dogs, we studied chimpanzees and other species and then we saw them interact, we saw them have some emotions and then we figured that their emotions were similar to human being emotions. But at some point we kind of started to feel like maybe we started to feel like that, that way, that we were better than animals. So maybe we saw ourselves as souls saw ourselves as deep intellectual thinkers and of course the more we develop the more we progress as a society and more technology we have around us and the more philosophy we study and deep concepts we kind of understand that we have something that other species don't have so we may see ourselves as better than other species and forget to study this these evolutionary factors and this is what he's pointing out that this is actually a moralistic fallacy because we feel we are better than other species. So we see ourselves as souls, we see ourselves as uh, demigods or a creation from God or something like that. That's not really part of everything else in nature. And this is uh, of course wrong. We are of course different and we do have a lot of extra tool sets, but the basic tool sets we have, we share with animals. So you can see here two swans fighting as human beings fight still here you can see a single cell bacteria it uh, can avoid predators it can reproduce produce a waste product seek a self safe environment so already here you can actually see that it has some guiding system and something that makes it run away or seek something else right so in a way it kind of feels it ways around the world and has a some kind of feelings or emotions that makes it react and go away or go away from something so at some point you will need to start to call these kind of things feelings and emotions and where you do that we can discuss that for an eternity maybe in fish maybe in bacteria maybe in uh, in mammals but Either way, you can see that other species also seek something and they are trying to survive and reproduce. So here you see what is this doing? 
suckling her young. Yeah. So here you see a mother doing something that a mother in a in a human species also would do. Again, some also emotional states related to that protection and defending and trying to survive. This uh, sentence actually I think is very interesting. Something we talk a lot about in psychology. If you start in psychology and you start reading uh, and you start reading textbooks, you actually see a lot of this kind of stuff from William James. He wrote this in 1884 about feelings and emotions. Do you feel an emotion first or do you have a physiological reaction first? So if you see a bear, do you feel scared and then start to sweat? Or do you start to sweat and then feel scared okay so does your body react and then create an emotion or does your or do you does your brain create an emotion that then causes your body to react that's an interesting um, philosophical concept and he was one of the first psychologists so he actually had a lot of these concepts and cool tools and cool ideas about psychology that we are still working on today he was one of the of the grandfathers of psychology and a lot of people look up to him because he was one of the first but you ca can avoid him you don't need to read anything he wrote because he's just historical it's not really that significant for modern research but as you can see here Plutnik answer to this kind of question of what comes first the physiological change or the emotional state is that well we actually cannot answer this question because it's a feedback loop so it's always a feedback back loop here, right? I can even read it like danger, fear and increased autonomic activity. So the emotional state and physiological reaction appears at the same time, but then it's also a feedback loop. So for example, if you are in a forest, you may already anticipate a bear, right? Or if you have seen 10 bear bears already, <laughs> then you probably fear uh, fearing them a bit more because you anticipate seeing a new one or maybe you hear something in the forest and you're alone and it's dark so you have a higher higher response to to this kind of stuff or maybe it's uh, you're in a group of 10 people and it's it's sunny day so you don't feel this kind of anticipation yeah also of course your experiences also shape your anticipation to this kind of stuff it doesn't mean you can shape it any way you feel you see fit uh, i do see a lot of theories about that today in self-help books and stuff like that where people tell you that you can feel anything you want so no matter what happens or where you are you can you can just pick and choose the emotions you you want and that's not really how we work but either way we uh down here to uh, to this list he has in his paper and this is where the interesting stuff starts and this is where he he presents his model that's very very fascinating and um, maybe this stuff is not as scientific as the other stuff so the other stuff what this model is based on these key concepts about emotions being something that's naturally evolved in human beings and we share them with other species even though we have a bigger range of emotions of course and bigger range of personalities too we still have something we share with them and this is based on these kind of basic principles about in our environment there can be a threat an obstacle or we want to gain an object and as you can see here it can be a danger it can be an enemy it can be we want to possess something something has abandoned us there's a friend there's a poison we want to examine something or, or we we want to Oh, something happens and we, then we ask what is it and as you can see there's an emotional state to all of these things so if you feel if you if there's a danger we should feel fear and then we should escape and seek safety okay and if there's an enemy we should maybe feel anger could feel anger and then we would attack the enemy and then destroy the obstacle so if, let's see it's a small enemy like a a rat or something like that right in a natural environment so we feel anger we attack we destroy so it doesn't destroy us our kids and um, that's how you need to see it that all our emotions and all our feelings all our emotional states are developed to solve some problems either personal problems or social problems like with this friend problem social problem 
or maybe it's a poison so we feel disgust and then we vomit and we eject the poison right or we go away from this uh, poisonous object and these emotional states are actually something that's it's kind of neurochemicals so uh, for example if we uh, we see a danger we see a hyena in the savannah it, that's a danger and then we feel fear and the fear will activate these neurochemicals in our brain so our brain will will go into the sphere mode automatic so it's like a setting it's like if you have a race car you have a race car setting and then you have a normal setting or if you have a pc you can have a gaming mode and then a normal mode so this gaming mode this is a fear gaming mode and we have tens of thousands of instincts in our brain doing various things love and um, jealousy and <laughs> caring and stuff like that so or we can react to objects and and notice objects in a certain way well this fear will activate the whole brain in a certain way so it will be a cloud that pops up in the brain like really really fast and then the brain will be focused on activated instincts for fear so our vision our hearing our body you know our legs our arms everything will be activated for this kind of emotional state so we will be focused on this state especially if it's very very strong of course it's if, if it's weaker then the cloud is not as hazy so we will have other instincts also interacting with us but if we for example feel strong hunger and then feel fear then this hunger emotion will of course not be dominating this fear emotion will dominate our body and we will activate ourselves to to react to this fear it's not something in the paper, at least I don't think so. It's just something, you know, something you need to understand about emotional states that um, an emotional state in evolutionary psychology is something that's, that activates us, that, that ignites us to go in a certain direction with the whole range of instincts. So even though we have a whole range of wants and needs and instincts and, you know, our, our eyes can see a lot of things, when we activate a whole a, a whole setting we we activate a whole uh, a focus yeah yeah that, yeah but e either way we're going down to something more interesting now we're going down to this model okay Plitnik developed this model about basic emotions so actually I, I i don't disagree with this range of basic emotions these eight joy trust fear surprise sadness disgust anger anticipation I don't agree with that at all. I think there's a whole other range of emotions that are primary emotions that are primary setting. But this is his primary emotions and this is what he developed his uh, theory on. And you can see them up here. I will just scroll a bit up. You can see them here. Fear, anger, joy, sadness, acceptance, disgust, anticipation, or expectation, or surprise, right? So all these basic range let's go down again all these basic range of emotions there will be um there will be an emotion emotional states developed to solve some problem in our natural environment as you can see here right remember this list with all these uh, range of problems well these are the eight um, responses and this interest the interesting thing about this model is that joy is the opposite of sadness and disgust is the opposite of trust surprise is the opposite of anticipation anger is the opposite of fear so you have these opposites too so again this model is very interesting because it has this this kind of uh, very cool structure to it and it's colorful it's pretty it's nice of course i won't fully agree with it and no one really will because this is not how our emotions looks like in our head our emotions in our head are developed evolutionary over many millions of years so they will be very unstructured and very weird and some will be strong some will be weak some will not be uh, activated as much as other emotional states but these are this is a basic model that explains the basic emotions range without being fully scientific another thing about it is that these emotion ranges have balances so anger can become range or rage or annoyance so anger can increase in balance and become range or it can decrease in balance and become annoyance 
and here the same with joy it can increase and become ecstasy or decrease and become serenity and how are these kind of ranges found it's because we ask people about it so we ask people to place emotions on a scale or okay do you feel joy when you feel joy how else could you describe it what if you feel extra joy then i feel ecstasy okay what if you feel less joy then i feel serenity okay so here you already have this line of feelings emotions here and if you ask 100 people or 200 people you kind of can already start to structure the, these emotions and facts analysis and, and see how they fit together. So you can ask people to group these words together in emotional states. You can also ask them to, to group them like this, on this. So here you can see if they place joyful here, they place accepting and adventurous pretty close to, but then on the opposite side, you know, emotions that are very, very dissimilar they have uncertain, surprised, and depressed. And they also have them combined. So they say, oh, well, when I'm depressed, it's un I'm also feeling some uncertainty and sadness. So these are pretty similar. And when, they, when a lot of people answer like this and group emotions and also have them on a scale, so you can have joyful here, and then they will place serenity here in the middle of the circle, and then ecstasy outside of the circle. So they will have a whole circle they can place stuff on, or just give numbers to, to the emotions. And then they can also give them balances. They can say, well, joyful is a 50. What about ecstasy? Oh, ecstasy is a 100. But it's also close to joyful because it's kind of a similar emotion. And this is how we do these kind of things. We just ask people about it. And then we, we assume that, that people are talking about something that's universal and something that's in us. And then we try to to find these things in real life. So when we ask people about these words and their feelings and emotional states, we can also go out in nature, go out in the, I mean, among people or uh, study chimpanzees and see if we observe some of the same things there. Um, also another thing was that uh, you can see anticipation, joy and trust. Again here, very, very similar, right? And then disgust, sadness, surprise, similar again. This is how they are grouped, as you can see here. They are grouped together in a way where similar emotions will be close together. And the last thing is, of course, that these eight emotions and their balance, their range, cannot really describe all of human beings and all of our emotional states. So we can actually combine emotions. So serenity and acceptance will combine into love and interest and serenity will combine into optimism. Annoyance, interest will combine into aggressiveness. So we have this basic range and then we have combinations. And then with these combinations, you can actually explain basically the whole emotional range according to Plitnik, okay, according to him. And this is also true in some way. So we can combine emotions, we can figure out new emotional states, but how they are combined is something we actually don't really know fully we kind of have some very basic ideas about it but we don't know exactly how they are combining so we don't know if this model is is correct but it does look very very pretty that's basically the paper this is of course the main um, the main guy behind these kind of theories uh, charles darwin was um, proposed natural selection and he also uh, wrote this book the expression of emotions in men and animals in 1892 and here he has a lot of photos and a lot of uh, ideas about emotions and how we feel emotions in a similar way to other animals so here you can see a chimpanzee that's disappointed and sulky and this is what we build it on so we go back to the basics and try to understand how emotions work. Also, another thing, and this is just a Wikipedia article, and you can see these, you can see his wheel here. But what I really wanted this to show this, this is the, the 10 postulates he has. So this is how he built this emotion wheel. So animals and humans, we, we have emotions, animals have emotions, they are evolved, 
they solve survival issues, they have prototype typical patterns. We have basic emotions, so joy is a basic emotion. For example, anticipation and anger are basic emotions. According to him, we do have basic emotions and all of these postulates are true, but what the basic emotions are, we kind of have a big debate about actually. So it's not true that these are the very basic emotions, these eight. Maybe they are, but other theories have other basic emotions, basically the same, but also one more, one less or something like that. Then we can combine emotions. So for example, joy and fear can combine into a new emotion. We also have opposites. So for example, anger and fear, joy and sadness. We also have similar emotions. So anger and disgust in a way, I mean, but more like joy and anticipation maybe, or trust and fear. Well, I don't know, but yeah, whatever. <laughs> you do have similar emotions and his model can, can be a bit weird, but it, it is true that there are similar emotions. And then you can also have an intensity of an emotional state. So you can feel great fear or a bit less fear. And this is how they are combining. Let me just zoom in. That's what I want to, to show that joy and trust could, for example, combine into love. And I don't know if that's true, like in real life, but in his model, this is how it works because um, it's his model. And as you can see, these are the eight basic emotions, these joy, trust, fear, surprise, and they can combine into a lot of emotional ranges. And opposites will also combine into conflict. So that's pretty interesting, right? This is his wheel. So for example, you can have joy combining with trust or joy combining with fear and stuff like that. And this is the main basis for his theory. As you can see, joy, trust, fear, surprise, sadness, disgust, anger, anticipation. And as you can see here, it's again the same possess, friend, danger, what is it, abandonment, poison, enemy, examine. So you see an enemy, you feel anger, attack and destroy the obstacle. Okay. So the anger all needs to be seen as something that solves something in our environment. It's not just an emotion, it's just it's not just something we can talk about and philosophize about. It's actually something that should be seen as a tool to solve some problem. This is how uh, I added these words to, to illustrate that joy is possess, trust is in-group member, fear is danger, surprise is a sudden no novel object, Sadness is isolation. So all these words um, I added here in blue, they describe what kind of problem these emotion states were trying to solve or they are trying to solve in a natural environment, according to Plutchnik. This is another way you can just see the emotional wheel, just with faces if you want to. And here you can see how they are combining. I don't know if this is correct, but it does look kind of correct. I took it from Wikipedia, but I think some of these do look weird. But either way, you can see that there's, there's a line, for example, between surprise and disgust. And when you combine surprise and disgust, when you feel the same, these two emotions at the same time, you get unbelief. These are... <laughs> They're just emotions, you know, I just found um, a table with a lot of emotions just to illustrate that we do know that uh, there is this range of emotions and then can they do interact with each other as he proposed. So they do interact with each other in, in, in this way here. 
his basic theories. The 10 postulates. But then in principle, you can create another model out of that. So here you have another model called the Geneva Emotions Wheel, probably because it's developed in Geneva. Um, and as you can see, it's a bit different. For example, on the bottom, you have calm emotions. On the top, you have activated emotions. So you activate, you seek out. On, on the bottom, you have emotions that make you stay calm, stay relieved, stay, stay hidden. On the right, you have pleasant emotions. So you feel joy, excitement, pleasure. On the left, you have unpleasant emotions. And this is how he structured it based on what people answered again on these kind of circles when remember from the paper there was this circle where either people could give could group words together or they they could also give them balance and stuff like that so here they could group words like this and he felt that these people grouped their emotions like this so he probably looked at similar data to what Plitnik looked at but developed a totally different model and of course here you can also see the balance the joy can become smaller and this is symbolized by the circles the circles can become smaller i think i actually skipped this and um, yeah i should have talked about it a bit before but this is actually something that illustrates how we can develop more on these kind of models and built on top of these great ideas that Plitschnik gave us. So here we go into neurochemicals and we look at neurochemicals specifically and what they are doing. So for example, here the theory is that, again, as Plitschnik proposed, that emotions are solving something in our environment. So we have individual needs and then we have social needs. And in individual needs, we have basic functioning, basic survival. And as you can see, basic survival, for example, is disgust, rage, fear, right? And these are systems. So we have disgust system, rage system, fear system. Of course, these basic systems that are activating these neurochemicals in our brain and are working in these brain areas, as described here on the right, these are the systems that are there in a body to make us survive and these are actually the systems that our emotions are built on top of so emotions are activating these systems guiding these systems and controlling these systems in a way that we can activate our whole body to to solve this problem and you also have social needs so you have individual needs and social needs and again you have a loss system need attachment system care nurturance nurturance system, play system, power dominance system. And when you look at all these systems and you look at all these neuroendorphins in the brain, neurochemicals, and then all these brain structures and how they work together, you can kind of start to structure some emotional system that makes sense and can be found in a brain. And then when you have all these basic survival methods, so you have you have an understanding of how human beings could survive in primitive environments as we did in the past where we evolved evolutionary then you can start to create a, a model of the human brain and a model of the emotional scope that we where that we can feel that we can play in and this is very uh, important this is as you can see, it's very similar to what Plitschnik talked about. It's a bit laggy, so I don't know. Yeah, it's very similar to what Plitschnik talked about here. Or you can like go to Wikipedia and maybe go do it a bit faster. You can see it here. Or go to this. This was actually probably the best one. There, you can see them here. As you can see, these kind of these kind of areas where we need to solve something either socially or individually as uh, single people they are the areas where we can uh, create an emotional system out from and with these new rethinkings of his model and 
adaptations and more developments, uh, I think we can have some new emotional wheels like this Geneva emotional wheel. But this was, of course, not created based, based on any study. It was just created based on what people responded and then they grouped these emotions in primitive matter. So, yeah, that's basically it. Um, I think I already said a lot of stuff and talked a lot. So this is the basic emotional theory of Plutchik, uh, of his emotional wheel and how it all works, <laughs> how it all combines into one and then how the emotions combine and what they create of new emotions. For example, if, 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 if joy and trust creates love, uh, I mean, we can debate that, but in his emotional wheel, it's, it's very clear that all of this interacts and, and makes sense and you can present it like this and it makes sense to people and it kind of explains some of our emotional range and then you can of course use other models too but that's that's it <laughs>